All right. This is going to be chapter one from part one in the aim and structure of physical theory by Pierre Duhem, which is a huge classic in philosophy of science and was originally printed in a long time ago. <laughs> All right. Chapter one, physical theory and metaphysical explanation. Section one, physical theory considered as explanation. The first question we should face is, what is the aim of a physical theory? To this question, diverse answers have been made, but all of them may be reduced to two main principles. A physical theory, certain logician, logicians have replied, um, has for its object the explanation of a group of laws experimentally established. A physical theory, others, other thinkers have said, is an abstract system whose aim is to summarize and classify logically a group of experimental laws without claiming to explain these laws. We are going to examine these two answers one after the other and weigh the reasons for accepting or rejecting each of them. We begin with the first, which regards a physical theory as an explanation. But first, what is an explanation? To explain, explicate, explicare, is to strip reality of the appearances covering it like a veil in order to see the bare reality itself. The observation of physical phenomena does not put us into relation with the reality hidden underneath the sensible appearances, but enables us to apprehend the sensible appearances themselves in a particular and concrete form. Besides, experimental laws do not have material reality for their object, but deal with these sensible appearances taken, it is true, in an abstract and general form. So experimental laws are not physically concretely real themselves. There's something that's about stuff that's physically concretely real. Removing or tearing away the veil from these sensible appearances, theory proceeds into and underneath them and seeks what is really in bodies. So bodies here is sort of the general term for like physical mass stuff, what's really causing bodies to behave the way they do. For example, string or wind instruments have produced sounds to which we have listened closely and which we have heard become stronger or weaker, higher or lower in a thousand nuances, productive in us of auditory sensations and musical emotions. Such are the acoustic facts. These particular and concrete sensations have been elaborated by our intelligence, following the laws by which it functions, and have provided us with such general and abstract notions as intensity, pitch, octave, perfect major or minor chord, timber, etc. So those are sort of the experimental laws for the acoustic facts and sensations that we have. The experimental laws of acoustics aim at the enunciation of fixed relations among these and other equally abstract and general notions. A law, for example, teaches us what relation exists between the two dimensions or the dimensions of two strings of the same metal which yield two sounds of the same pitch or two sounds an octave apart. But these abstract notions, sound intensity, pitch, timber, etc., depict to our reason no more than the general characteristics of our sound perceptions. These notions get us to know sound as it is in relation to us, not as it is by itself in sounding bodies. This reality, whose external veil alone appears in our sensations, is made known to us by theories of acoustics. So here, the veil of sensation or the veil of appearances is those musical sensations that we're having, but there is something behind it such that it's bringing about those musical sensations in us. And that's what explanation is gonna be trying to get at. Uh, this reality whose external veil alone appears in our sensations is made known to us by theories of acoustics. The latter, or the theories of acoustics, are to teach us that where our perceptions grasp only that appearance we call sound, there is in reality a very small and very rapid periodic motion. That intensity and pitch are only external aspects of the amplitude and frequency of this motion, and that timber is the apparent manifestation of the real structure of this motion, the complex sensation which results from the diverse vibratory motions into which we can analyze it. Acoustic theories are therefore explanations. So here he wants to say, look, there's 
something that gives rise to those sensations that we have when we listen to music. And we classify those using these abstract terms like timber um, or you know, octaves. So you can say of two different sounds that they are one octave apart or that something has a higher pitch than something else. But those are uh, experimental laws. They're not yet an explanation. The explanation for those experimental laws has to do with something that's vibrating. So like vibrations in the air and then changes in pitch are changes in say amplitude of the vibration and changes in timber are also changes in the sort of fine structure of the uh, oscillations that are taking place. And that's what he means by the explanation. So it's not something that's like the Kantian noumena. It is something that's just behind those terms that we're using in music to keep track of acoustic facts. So you can still get to what explains those musical facts about timber and pitch are these further features about uh, vibrations in the air. All right. The explanation which acoustic theories give of experimental laws governing sound claims to give us certainty. It can, in a great many cases, make us see with our own eyes the motions to which it attributes these phenomena and feel them with our fingers. Most often, we find that physical theory cannot attain that degree of perfection. It cannot offer itself as a certain explanation of sensible appearances, for it cannot render accessible to the senses the reality it proclaims as residing underneath those appearances. It is then content with proving that all our perceptions are produced as if the reality were what it asserts. Such a theory is a hypothetical explanation. Let us, for example, take a set of phenomena observed with the sense of sight. The rational analysis of these phenomena leads us to conceive certain abstract and general notions expressing the properties we come across in every perception of light, a simple or complex color, brightness, etc. Experimental laws of optics make us acquainted with the fixed relation among these abstract and general notions, as well as among other analogous notions. One law, for instance, connects the intensity of yellow light reflected by a thin plate with the thickness of the plate and the angle of incidence of the rays which illuminate it. So you can see how this is following from the acoustic analogy. Of these experimental laws, the vibratory theory of light, so the theory that light is a vibration, gives a hypothetical explanation. It supposes that all the bodies we see, feel, or weigh are immersed in an imponderable, unobservable medium called the ether. This is old school. To this ether, certain mechanical properties are attributed. The theory states that all simple light is a transverse vibration, very small and very rapid, of this ether, and that the frequency and amplitude of this vibration characterizes the color of the light and its brightness. And without enabling us to perceive the ether, puts us uh, without putting us in a position to observe directly the back and forth motion of light vibration, the theory tries to prove that its postulates entails consequences agreeing at every point with the laws furnished by experimental optics. So he's now making the case that what we know about optics, so the angle, um, for instance, a, a law like the angle of in, uh, the angle into which light comes to a mirror equals the angle at which it reflects off. Those are experimental laws for which we would like an explanation, and the explanation would be something like light is a kind of vibration in a medium called ether. And then you show, even though you can't see ether and you can't see the vibrations in the ether, you show that if that were true, then you would see the kinds of consequences that you see. And that's how explanations work in this case. Section two, according to the foregoing opinion, theoretical physics is subordinate to metaphysics. When a physical theory is taken as an explanation, its goal is not reached until every sensible appearance has been removed in order to grasp the physical reality. For example, Newton's research on the dispersion of light, so once again, we're back to the optics, has taught us to decompose the sensation we experience of light emanating from the sun. So we thought that was just, you know, light, but he broke it down into different colors. His experiments have shown us that this light is complex and resolvable into a certain number of simpler light phenomena, each associated with a determinate and invariable color. But these simple or monochromatic light data are abstract and general representations of certain sensations. 
They are sensible appearances, and we have only dissociated a complex appearance into other simpler appearances. But we have not reached the real thing. We have not given an explanation of the color effects. We have not constructed an optical theory. Thus, it follows that in order to judge whether a set of propositions constitutes a physical theory or not, we must inquire whether the notions connecting these propositions express in an abstract and general form the elements which really go to make up the material things or merely represent the universal properties perceived. So he's saying you need more than just abstract representations of the sensible appearances, you need something that's behind the sensible appearances. So it, it doesn't matter how complicated you get with your sensible appearances, you have to go beyond that, on this understanding of what a physical theory is supposed to do as an explanation. For such an inquiry to make sense, or to be at all possible, we must first of all regard as certain the following affirmation. Under the sensible appearances, which are revealed in our perceptions, there is a reality distinct from these appearances. This point granted, and he's not being Kantian here, it's worth noting, he's not talking about noumena, he's talking about something else. This point granted, and without it, the search for physical explanation could not be conceived. It is impossible to recognize having reached such an explanation until we have answered this next question. What is the nature of the elements which constitute material reality? Now, these two questions, does there exist a material reality distinct from sensible appearances, and what is the nature of this reality, do not have their source in experimental method, which is acquainted only with the sensible appearances and can discover nothing beyond them. The resolution of these questions transcends the methods used by physics. It is the object of metaphysics. Therefore, if the aim of physical theories is to explain experimental laws, theoretical, theoretical physics is not an autonomous science. It is subordinate to metaphysics. So that's a complicated conditional statement. All right, section three. According to the foregoing opinion, the value of a physical theory depends on the metaphysical system one adopts. The propositions which make up purely mathematical sciences are, to the highest degree, universally accepted truths. The precision of language and the rigor of the methods of demonstration leave no room for any permanent divergences among the views of different mathematicians. Over the centuries, doctrines are developed by continuous progress without new conquests causing the loss of any previously acquired domains. Once again, you get people who are wishing that we could just do more stuff like mathematics and geometry. Like, oh, they don't have to, you know, every time they make a new discovery, give up a whole bunch of stuff in the past um, as having been wrong. There is no thinker who does not wish for the science he cultivates a growth as calm and regular as that is of mathematics. But if there is a science for which this wish seems particularly legitimate, it is indeed theoretical physics. For of all the well-established branches of knowledge, it is surely the one which least departs from algebra and geometry. Now, to make physical theories depend on metaphysics is surely not the way to let them enjoy the privilege of universal consent. In fact, no philosopher, no matter how confident they may be in the value of the methods used in dealing with metaphysical problems, uh, can dispute the following empirical truth. So here's a thing that no philosopher can dispute. Consider and review all the domains of humanity's intellectual activity. None of the systems of thought arising in different eras or the contemporary systems born of different schools will appear more profoundly distinct, more sharply separated, more violently opposed to one another than those in the field of metaphysics. And really, lots of philosophers would agree with that. If theoretical physics is subordinated to metaphysics, the divisions separating the diverse metaphysical systems will extend into the domain of physics. A physical theory reputed to be satisfactory by the sectarians of one metaphysical school will be rejected by the partisans of another. Here, if we were having a lecture in class, I would also say some things though about interpretation. Sometimes they all accept the same mathematical structure, but they put a different metaphysical interpretation on it. So this might 
very easily account for what's currently going on with the discussions around quantum mechanics, for example. And in that case, you can have lots of the physical dis or the metaphysical disagreements while still agreeing about what the physical laws are. So consider, for example, the theory of the action exerted by a magnet on iron. And suppose for a moment that we are Aristotelians. What does the metaphysics of Aristotle teach us concerning the real nature of bodies? Every substance, in particular, every material substance, results from the union of two elements, one permanent, matter, sometimes he also calls it the substratum, and one variable, form, so the, the form that the matter is put into. You might have encountered this in like a metaphysics class at the 200 level. Though it's uh, through its permanence, the piece of matter before me remains always and in all circumstances the same piece of iron. Through the variations which its form undergoes, through the alterations that it experiences, the properties of the same piece of iron may change according to circumstances. It may be solid or liquid, hot or cold, and assume such and such a shape. Placed in the presence of the magnet, this piece of iron undergoes a special alteration in its form, becoming more intense with the proximity of the magnet. This alteration corresponds to the appearance of two poles and gives the piece of iron a principle of movement such that one pole tends to draw near the pole opposite to it on the magnet, and the other tends to be repelled by the one designated as the like pole on the magnet. So notice how he's speaking about this. It gives, when you bring a magnet near a piece of iron, it now gives the iron a principle of movement. So the iron can now move itself to get away from the wrong pole or towards the correct pole on the magnet. So it's, it's important to sort of note how he's apportioning the sort of the credit for the action right there. Such for the, because this is very Aristotelian, such for the Aristotelian philosopher is the reality hidden under the magnetic phenomena. When we have analyzed all these phenomena by reducing them to the properties of the magnetic quality of the two poles, we have given a, a complete explanation and formulated a theory altogether satisfactory. It was such a theory that uh, Niccolo Cabello constructed in 1629 in his remarkable work on magnetic philosophy. So apparently this guy was Aristotelian. If an Aristotelian declares he is satisfied with the theory of magnetism as Father Cabello conceives it, the same will not be true of a Newtonian philosopher faithful to the cosmology of Father Boscovich. Worth noting, Newton was also a Neoplatonist. So he's getting at a kind of classic uh, Neo-Aristotelian versus Neoplatonist metaphysical divide here. According to the natural philosophy which Boscovich has drawn from the principles of Newton and his disciples to explain the laws of the action which the magnet exerts on the iron by a magnetic alteration of the substantial form of the iron is to explain nothing at all. We are really concealing our ignorance of reality under words that sound deep but are hollow. Harsh. Material substance is not composed of matter and form. It can be resolved into an immense number of points, deprived of extension and shape, but having mass. Between any two of these points is exerted a mutual attraction or repulsion proportional to the product of the masses and to a certain function of the distance separating them. Among the, where it's distance squared, that's part of the function. Among these points, there are some which form the bodies themselves. A mutual action takes place among the latter points. So it's not that one of them gives a principle of mo motion to the other. There is something mutual between them. So you have to have both of them involved. It's a different way of construing the relation. And as soon as the distances separating them exceed a certain limit, this action becomes the universal gravitation studied by Newton. Other points, deprived of this action of gravity, compose weightless fluids, such as electric fluids and calorific fluid. Suitable assumptions about the masses of all these material points, about their distribution, and about the form of the functions of the distance on which their mutual actions depend, are to account for all physical phenomena. For example, in order to explain magnetic effects, we imagine that each molecule of iron carries equal masses of south magnetic fluid and north magnetic fluid. That they hadn't figured out magnetism totally at this point in time, as you can tell. Uh, although he's also still speaking as this sort of uh, Neoplatonic Newtonian at this point. 
um, the two magnetic masses exert on one another an action proportional to the product of those masses and to the inverse square of the distance between them. Finally, that this action is a repulsion or an attraction according to whether the masses are of the same or of different kinds. Thus was developed the theory of magnetism, which, inaugurated by Franklin, uh, Openus, Tobias Mayer, and Coulomb, came to full flower in the classical memoirs of Poisson. Does this theory give an explanation of magnetic phenomena capable of satisfying an atomist? Surely not. Among some portions of magnetic fluid distant from one another, the theory admits the existence of actions of attraction or repulsion. For an atomist, such actions at a distance amount to appearances which cannot be taken for realities. So then the atomist is like, no, but really, when you get really close down to the atom by atom level, then here's an atom and here's an atom, and how are they attracting or repelling one another? So the animists in this case used to be in the early modern period, also called the mechanists. And they're like, no, but really, attraction at a distance doesn't make any sense. It's, it's not an explanation. According to the atomistic teaches, teachings, matter is composed of very small, hard, and rigid bodies of diverse shapes scattered profusely in the void. Separated from uh, each other, two such corpuscles cannot in any way influence each other. So when they're not touching, they can't you know, influence one another. It is only when they come in contact with one another that their impenetrable natures clash and that their motions are, codified, are modified according to fixed laws. The magnitudes, shapes, and masses of the atoms and the rules governing their impact alone uh, and the rules governing their impact alone provide the sole satisfactory explanation which physical laws can admit. In order to explain in an intelligible manner the various motions which a piece of iron undergoes in the presence of a magnet, we have to imagine that floods of magnetic corpuscles escape from the magnet in compressed, though invisible and intangible streams, or else are precipitated toward the magnet. In their rapid course, these corpuscles collide in various ways with the molecules of the iron, and from these collisions arise the forces, which is superficial philosophy attributed to magnetic attraction and repulsion. Such is the principle of a theory of the magnet's properties, already outlined by Lucretius, who was one of the original animists, developed by Gassendi in the 17th century, and often taken up again since that time. Shall we not find more minds, difficult to satisfy, who condemn this theory for not explaining anything at all and for taking appearances for reality? Here is where the Cartesians appear. According to Descartes, matter is essentially identical with that extended in length, breadth, and depth as the language of geometry goes. We have to consider only its various shapes and motions. Matter for the Cartesians is, if you please, a kind of vast fluid incompressible and absolutely homogeneous. Hard, unbreakable atoms and the empty spaces separating them are merely so many appearances, so many illusions. Certain parts of the universal fluid may be animated by constant whirling or vortical motions. To the coarse eyes of the atomists, these whirlpools or vortices will look like individual corpuscles. The intermediary fluid transmits from one vortex to the other, which Newtonians, through insufficient analysis, according to the Cartesians, will take for actions at a distance. Such are the principles of the physics first sketched by Descartes, which Malbranche investigated further, and to which W. Thompson, aided by the hydrodynamic researches of Cauchy and Helmholtz, has given the, elabor uh, the elaboration and precision characteristic of present-day mathematical doctrines. So the vertical theory of, no, really, there's very small things bumping into each other, and there's little whirling vortices of them, and that's how it transmits the influence to the iron. This Cartesian physics cannot dispense with the theory of magnetism. Descartes had already tried to construct such a theory. The corkscrews of subtle matter with which uh, Descartes, not without some naivety in his theory, replaced the magnetic corpuscles of Gassendi, were succeeded among the Cartesians of the 19th century by the vortices conceived more scientifically by Maxwell, Although Maxwell eventually gave up this sort of thing and just really went for a very elegant mathematical formulation of the theory. Thus, we see each philosophical school glorifying a theory which reduces magnetic phenomena to the elements with which it composes the essence of matter. But the other schools rejecting this theory, uh, in which their principles do not let them recognize a satisfactory explanation of magnetism. 
four, the quarrel over occult causes. There is one form of criticism which very often occurs when one cosmological school attacks another or one like metaphysical school attacks another. So they're, they're sort of calling that cosmological here. The first accuses the second of appealing to occult causes. The great cosmological schools, the Aristotelian, the Newtonian, the atomistic and the Cartesian may be arranged in an order such that each admits the existence in matter of a smaller number of essential properties than the preceding schools are willing to admit. And in fact, this continues on to the current day where we just have like grounding or something like this. Okay. Uh, the Aristotelian school composes the substance of bodies out of only two elements, matter and form. But this form may be affected by qualities whose number is not limited. In fact, he was very profligate in what could count. Each physical property can thus be attributed to a special quality, a sensible quality directly accessible to our perception, like weight, solidity, fluidity, heat, or brightness, or else an occult quality whose effects alone will appear in an indirect manner as with magnetism or electricity. The Newtonians reject this endless multiplication of qualities in order to simplify to a high degree the notion of material substance. So now instead of all sorts of different categories of stuff, you have bodies that move and then, you know, complicated ways in which you can talk about the motion. In the elements of matter, the Newtonians leave only masses, mutual attractions, and shapes when they do not go as far as Boscovich and several of his successors, which reduce the elements to unextended points. So essentially even just what is the center of mass or something like this, that's it. That's all you have to keep track of. The atomistic school goes further. Its material elements preserve mass, shape, and hardness. But the forces through which the elements act on one another, according to the Newtonian school, disappear from the domain of reality. They are regarded merely as appearances and fictions. So the idea that two things just somehow attract each other across empty space, they're like, no, no, a cult. Finally, the Cartesians push to the limit this tendency to strip material substances of various properties. They reject the hardness of atoms and even the distinction between plenum and void. So the plenum is just the opposite of a void. A void is where there is no matter, and a plenum is the idea that you can't have genuinely empty space. There's always some kind of matter filling it. So Aristotle, for instance, thought there could be no void, so everything was a plenum. Uh, in order to identify matter, as Leibniz said, with completely naked extension and its modification. So he's like, you can't even ask, is it full, is it empty? Nope. Thus, each cosmological school admits in its explanations certain properties of matter which the next school refuses to take as real, for the latter regards them as mere words designating more deeply hidden realities without revealing them. It groups them, in short, with the occult qualities created in so much profusion by scholasticism. So, even if we agree on the experimental laws, the very next stage where you're getting the explanation is exactly where everybody's going to disagree with each other and accuse others of using occult causes for their explanations. It is hardly necessary to recall that all the cosmological schools other than the Aristotelians have agreed in attacking the latter, the Aristotelians, for the arsenal of qualities which it stored in substantial form, an arsenal which added a new quality every time a new phenomena had to be explained. He just thought you could just keep going. Um, but Aristotelian physics has not been the only one obliged to meet such criticisms. The Newtonians, who endow material elements with attractions and repulsions acting at a distance, seem to the atomists and the Cartesians to be adopting one of those purely verbal explanations usual with the old scholasticism, so late medieval sorts of stuff. Newton's Principia has hardly been published when his work excited the sarcasm of the atomistic clan grouped around Huygens. Quote, so far as concerns the cause of the tides given by Mr. Newton, Huygens wrote Leibniz, I am far from satisfied, nor do I feel happy about any of his other theories built on his principle of attraction, which appears to me absurd. If Descartes had been alive at that time, he would have used a language similar to that of Huygens. In fact, Father Mersenne had submitted to Descartes a work by Roberval in which the author adopted a form of universal gravitation long before Newton. So Newton wasn't actually the first person to come up with the idea of universal gravitation. Also worth noting that of his three laws, two of them he got from Descartes, so that, you know, these ideas had been around for a while. So 
Descartes was able to say something about universal gravitation, even though he wasn't saying it specifically about Newton's. And now we get to the quote. Quote, nothing is more absurd than the assumption added to the foregoing. The author assumes that a certain property is inherent in each of the parts of the world's matter, and that by the force of this property, the parts are carried toward one another and attract each other. He also assumes that a like property inheres in each part of the earth considered in relation with the other parts of the earth, and that this property does not in any way disturb the preceding one. So this chunk of earth has a relation to that chunk over there, but also to that chunk over there and that chunk over there. But somehow the relation between, you know, it and this one and it and this one doesn't interfere with its relation to that one, which now seems really sensible to us. But you can see how at the time that would have seemed like, really, how many chunks of matter can this chunk of matter right here be related to without those relations interfering. All right. The parts uh, is inherent in each part of the world matter and that by force of this property, the parts are carried toward one another and attract each other. He also assumes that a like property inheres in each part of the earth. Oh yeah, considered in uh, relation with the other parts of the earth and that this property does not in any way disturb the preceding one. In order to understand this, we must not only assume that each material particle is animated by this attraction and repulsion, uh, and even animated by a large number of diverse souls that do not disturb each other, but also that these souls of material, material particles are endowed with knowledge of a truly divine sort, so that they may know without any medium what takes place at very great distances and act accordingly. So in some sense, this is the criticism that he's trying to make of Newton's account of the tides as being caused by the gravitational attraction of the moon. Like, how is this bit of water supposed to just know in this kind of divine way where exactly the moon is? When you describe it that way, it does in fact sound kind of spooky. You're like, really though, how is this water keeping track of the moon? How is it supposed to just know inherently in it that it's supposed to you know, follow where the moon is and where the moon is? So they were saying, no, only God is that omnipotent. <laughs> So that was the end of the quote. The Cartesians agree then with the atomists when it comes to condemning as an occult quality the action at a distance which Newtonians invoke in their theories. But turning next against the atomists, the Cartesians deal just as harshly with the hardness and indivisibility attributed to corpuscles by the atomists. The Cartesian uh, Dennis Papin wrote to the atomist Huygens, quote, another thing that bothers me is that you seem to believe that perfect hardness is of the essence of bodies. It seems to me that you are there assuming an inherent quality which takes us beyond mathematical or mechanical principles. And really they thought those are either it's a mathematical principle or it's a mechanical parts bumping into other parts. And if it's not those, then you don't get it. The Adamus Huygens, it is true, did not deal less harshly with Cartesian opinion. Quote, your other difficulty, he replied to Pepin, is that I assume hardness to be of the essence of bodies, whereas you and Descartes admit only their extension, by which I see that you have not yet rid yourself of that opinion for which I have long time judged very absurd. So now he's just reporting people's like dissing of each other. Section five, no metaphysical system suffices in constructing a physical theory. So now we're going to move beyond all these arguments. Each of the metaphysical schools scolds its rivals for appealing in its explanations to notions which are themselves unexplained and are really occult qualities. Could not this criticism be nearly always applied to the scolding school itself? In order for the philosophers belonging to a certain school to declare themselves completely satisfied with a theory constructed by the physicists of the same school, all the principles used in this theory would have to be deduced from the physics professed by that school. If an appeal is made in the course of the explanation of a physical phenomena to some law which that metaphysics is powerless to justify, then no explanation will be forthcoming and physical theory will have failed in its aim. So there's a way in which no matter, even when you offer something like uh, attraction and repulsion, you're then on the hook to explain that. And so you just ultimately are doomed to fail if you're going that route. So he's, he's coming around to telling us this is not, this cannot be what physical theory does. Now, no metaphysics gives instruction exact enough or detailed enough to make it possible to derive all the elements of a physical theory from it. So there's always going to be more to the physical theory that would be compatible with this or some other metaphysical theory. No metaphysical theories, he's saying, are sufficiently precise to do this. 
In fact, the instruction furnished by a metaphysical doctrine concerning the real nature of bodies consists most often of negations. The Aristotelians, like the Cartesians, deny the possibility of empty space. So they're not telling you what there is sufficiently specifically. They're just like, but there is no empty space. They're denying it. So that's the negation. The Newtonians reject any quality which is not reducible to a force acting among material points. The atomists and Cartesians deny any action at a distance. The Cartesians do not recognize among the diverse parts of matter any distinctions other than shape and motion. All these negations are appropriately argued when it is a matter of condemning a theory proposed by an adverse school, but they appear singularly sterile when we wish to derive the principles of a physical theory. Descartes, for example, denied that there is anything else in matter than extension in length, breadth, and depth, and its diverse modes, that is to say, shapes and motions. But with these data alone, he could not even begin to sketch the explanation of a physical law. At the very least, before attempting the construction of any theory, he would have had to know the general laws governing diverse motions. Hence, he proceeded from his metaphysical principles to attempt, first of all, to deduce that dynamics, so the principles of motion. The perfection of God requires him to be immutable in his plans, God to be immutable. From this immutability, the following consequence is drawn by Descartes. God preserves as constant the quantity of motion that he gave the world in the beginning. But this constancy of the quantity of motion in the world is still not a sufficiently precise or definite principle to make it possible for us to write any equation of dynamics. We must state it in a quantitative form, and that means translating the hitherto very vague notion, quantity of motion, into a completely determined algebraic expression. What then will be the mathematical meaning to be attached by the physicists to the words quantity of motion? This was several hundred years worth of argument that they had. According to Descartes, the quantity of motion of each material particle will be the product of its mass or of its volume, which in Cartesian physics is identical with its mass because it's homogeneous, times the velocity with which it's animated. So the quantity of motion is essentially mass times velocity. So we something kind of like momentum nowadays. And the quantity of motion of all matter in its entirety will be the sum of the quantities of motion of its diverse parts. This sum should, in any physical change, retain a constant value. So he's trying to, Descartes was trying to give a conservation law, but he was also trying to use the assumption that all mass is equal in volume, which we now know to be very untrue. Um, and so he ended up with something that was, you know, mass times uh, the, the velocity at which it was moving but before we had a properly defined term of velocity. Certainly the combination of algebraic magnitudes through which Descartes proposed to translate the notion of quantity of motion satisfies the requirements imposed in advance by our instinctive knowledge of such a translation. It is zero for a whole at rest and always positive for a group of bodies agitated by a certain motion. Its value increases when a determined mass increases the velocity of its movement it increases again when a given velocity affects a larger mass. But an infinity of other expressions might just as well have satisfied these requirements. For the velocity, we might uh, notably have substituted the square of the velocity. So we might have had something like one half times the mass times the velocity squared, which is just kinetic energy. Um, the algebraic expression obtained would then have coincided with what Leibniz was to call the living force. Instead of drawing from divine immutability the constancy of the Cartesian quantity of motion in the world, we should have deduced the constancy of the Leibnizian living force. So he's saying there's so many different mathematical ways in which you could get more precise about what he means by quantity of motion that that gets bigger or smaller under those circumstances, that really they're not telling you anything when they give you a metaphysics of that. So the physics has to come up with an equation that's determinant, but there's many, many, many very different determinant equations that would all go with the same metaphysical claim. So that's that's kind of what Duhem is pointing at. This will get picked up again in the later section that we're reading. Thus, the law which Descartes proposed to place at the base of dynamics undoubtedly agrees with the Cartesian metaphysics, but this agreement is not necessary. 
When Descartes rendered certain physical effects as mere consequences of such a law, he proved, it is true, that the effects do not contradict his principles of philosophy, but he did not give an explanation of the law by means of these principles. What we have just said about Cartesianism can be repeated about any metaphysical doctrine, which claims to terminate in a physical theory. In this theory, there are always posited certain hypotheses which do not have as their grounds the principles of the metaphysical doctrine. So whenever you go from a metaphysical doctrine to a physical theory, you always have to add more in order to get it sufficiently specific than there was in the metaphysical theory that you started with. Those who follow the thought of Boscovich admit that all the attractions and repulsions which are observable at a perceptible distance vary inversely with the square of the distance. It is this hypothesis which permits them to construct, construct three systems of mechanics, celestial, electrical, and magnetic. But this form of law is dictated to them by the desire to have their explanations agree with the facts and not by the requirements of their philosophy. So there was nothing in their philosophy that said it had to be an inverse square law. It could have been all sorts of others. And so it was the facts on the ground that were telling them, no, it has to be an inverse square law. The atomists admit that a certain law governs the collisions of corpuscles, but this law is a singularly bold extension to the atomic world of another law, which is permissible only when mass is big enough to be observed or considered. It is not deduced from the Epicurean philosophy. We cannot therefore derive from a metaphysical system all the elements necessary for the construction of a physical theory. The latter, the physical theory, always appeals to propositions which the metaphysical system has not furnished and which consequently remain mysteries for the partisans of that system. At the root of the explanations it claims to give, there always lies the unexplained. So just as a quick note to cont uh, contextualize this with some of the other things for which Duhem is known, one way in which we can talk about this is to say that for a given specific physical theory, it underdetermines which metaphysical theory is the right one for it. So there could be multiple different metaphysical theories, each of which are compatible with the physical theory, but none of which are uniquely compatible with it, or none of which it gives you enough material to choose between. And so this is going to be an ongoing discussion around the role of mathematical models, where you want to say that they're doing something that explains what happens, not merely describing what happens, but you'll also have to be very careful about what counts as an explanation because these explanations, you don't wanna to go too far and come up with things that are for somebody else merely occult causes. So there's going to be something about the actual physical facts and the experimental laws that underdetermines which theory tells you about it. So underdetermines just means it doesn't tell you enough to uniquely determine a single right answer. And similarly, for things that are metaphysical, like quantity of motion, that underdetermines what your physical theory should look like, because it could be uh, one over distance squared, it could just be one over distance, it could be one over distance cubed, it could be one half times one over distance, and so on and so forth. So your metaphysical theory doesn't, doesn't give you enough specifics to do your theory, it underdetermines this over here. So this idea of underdetermination sort of fits there, and that's why you don't, you can't just say the physical theory aims to give you metaphysical explanations. All right. 